Hello, everyone. Welcome to our online Zoom talk. My name is Sonja Lee Ament. I'm a program manager at the Friedrich Naumann Foundation for Freedom in Germany. And this web talk here is part of our female changemaker format, in which in the course of several online talks, we have invited a lot of inspiring personalities around the world who are moderator Caroline Gill interviews. So on this background today, we want to reflect on the lives of millions of women in Vietnam who don't have access to contraception and or safe abortion services. So we want to talk about reproductive rights and how access to contraception can allow women to take back control of their own lives. And on top of that, we will figure out how this can drive economic and social development, not only in Vietnam, but also in other countries around the world. So I'm really looking forward to that conversation for which we have invited inspiring speakers who you can already probably see here on screen. But before I introduce today's speakers, let me say a few words about the Friedrich Naumann Foundation, since some of you might participate in one of our events for the first time. So based on the principles of liberalism, the Friedrich Naumann Foundation offers political education in Germany and abroad. And with our events and publications, we help people to become actively involved in political affairs. And on top of that, we also do support talented young students with scholarships. And since 2007, the edition for Freedom has become an established part of our foundation's name. So it's Friedrich Naumann Foundation for Freedom. And as we all know, freedom is something a lot of places and people in this world still don't have. So this is what drives us to campaign for freedom and to take on the responsibility that comes with it. We have been doing this since founding our foundation in 1958. Our headquarter is based in Potsdam in Germany, and we maintain offices throughout Germany and in over 60 countries around the world. So yeah, this is the Friedrich Naumann Foundation. And now, as promised, it's a great honor for me to welcome our speakers for today. Our female changemaker is Nguyen Thi Bishang. She has been the head of MSI Vietnam for 18 years now. The organization MSI Reproductive Choices is committed to delivering compassionate, high quality sexual and reproductive health care for all. And the organization has over 9,000 team members working in 37 countries around the world. And under her leadership, MSI has been awarded the most innovative and sustainable NGO in the country. So welcome, Nguyen Thi Bishang. It's great to have you here today. Next, Professor Dr. Andreas Stoffers. He has been living in Southeast Asia since his studies and during his professional life in banking and as professor for international management. Since 2020, he leads the foundation project office in Hanoi, Vietnam. And Caroline Gill, I already mentioned she will interview our two guests today. She has a degree in European relations and socioeconomic transformation and for many years has initiated and moderated discussions with international experts. Now I'm almost finished talking, but before we start, let me explain one Zoom setting to you. You are very, very welcome to ask your questions during this web talk. So please use the button on the lower end of your screen. It's called Q&A. There you can post your questions and Caroline will try to tie in as many as possible. So now I uh, hope you will all enjoy this web talk. Caroline, you're welcome to start. Good day uh, around the world, good day to Germany and good evening to Vietnam because it's already 6.30 p.m. First of all, let me thank the Friedrich Naumann Foundation and especially Johanna Husting, the head of the office in Baden-Württemberg. And of course, you, Sonja Liament, the program manager for the introduction. My name is Caroline Giel and I'm very happy to be the host of the series Female Change America. We want to empower, we want to inspire women and men, of course, to be courageous, to stand up, because we believe that change starts at home, at work, and it starts always with a decision and introducing women from all over the world. We can understand their motivation, learn from the situation in the country, discuss solidarity and the power of the moment. It is already our eighth talk and it's the last talk for this year. We did discuss women's rights 
and the biographies of these inspiring women all around the world. Uh, we started with Belarus, Tunisia, Mexico, US, Poland, Russia, Kenya, and now it's the turn in like, to you, um, Mrs. Hang, um, to Vietnam. And we always invited an expert in German, uh, we call it Expertin, so uh, a female expert. But today it's like a premiere. Um, we have Professor Andreas Stoffers, as Sonja already introduced, he is based in Hanoi, working with the Friedrich Naumann Foundation. It's a big honor that you're with us, with your um, expertise. And as I heard you, you, you uh, now also in uh, Hanoi. Very welcome from my side. So as we heard already, uh, we had an introduction by, by Sonia, millions of women all around the world, but here today we discuss Vietnam, cannot access contraception and safe abortions. And uh, Mrs. Hank, your organization is committed to these topics, committed to um, help women in 37 countries around the world. And this organization is named after Mary Stopes. Mary Stopes was born in 1880 and who was an advocate for birth control and founded in 1921 the first instructional clinic for contraception in the United Kingdom. Um, but what's the special mission of MSI in Vietnam? And what do you think are the challenges um, in the work of Mary Stopes that like comparing it to other uh, challenges in the world? So we can hear you, can unmute and then we hear you. Yes, it's wonderful. Right. Okay. Well, um, hi, everybody. Um, uh, first of all, I would like to thank all of you and, and the foundation to really invite me to, uh, to speak and to share um, about MSI. And, and my special thank to, Dr., uh, to Prof Professor Andrea Stoffer, a, a, a very good friend uh, from Hanoi, uh, for, his, uh, for his, uh, his, his trust and, and faith on me. <laughs> um, so, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And I wish you all have a very good day today. Um, I, I think uh, women, women's health and sexual reproductive health are actually very, very close to my heart. And I, uh, I have to say that I have been dedicating 20, almost 23 years of my, my career to Mary Stopes, to developing uh, an organization in Vietnam. Um, and I have to say that this is, um, <clears throat> as, as you could see, the M MSI Reproductive Choices, as our name suggests, uh, we, we are pro-choice. We are pro-choice and we believe um, every woman and every girl uh, should have the power to decide and determine the path their life takes. And from contraception to safe abortion and life-saving services uh, following unsafe uh, abortion, we are committed to delivering compassionate, high-quality uh, sexual and reproductive health care for all. And just last year, MSI globally served um, 35,000 women a day. Over the world, um, 32 million women uh, receive a, a met, at least a method of contraception by, by MSI. Um, and I am very proud to share with you that in 2020, our services um, uh, globally prevented 13.4 million unintended pregnancies and uh, 5.6 6 million unsafe abortion and 35,000 maternal death. Uh, so these are the efforts made by um, the teams of 9,000 people, but it's also a lot of our colleagues and our partner uh, in different countries, including Vietnam. So um, we are very, very honored and very proud of that. Um, 
obviously, um, reproductive uh, choice is a uh, is the foundation upon upon which um, equality is uh, is based. For some, uh, choice means the ability to complete their education or to start a career. For others, it means uh, being able to look after their family or just having time and resources to develop their families' economies. For everyone, uh, choice means uh, the freedom to determine their own future, creating a fairer, more equal world for all. And uh, for a fairer future and more uh, equal world, we need to support women, uh, girls and girls and young women to access an education and, and choose the the part their lives takes. At MSI, we uh, work to make sure um, all women and girls have the reproductive choices to do so. We believe that if you uh, empower a woman or a girl, then you have empowered a home. And then you empower a country, and then you have empowered the whole world. So that, that's what we uh, believe. Um, in, in Vietnam, um, MSI has been making uh, every possible effort to materialize the sexual and reproductive rights for Vietnamese women as a critical human rights. Um, at the moment, uh, we are talking now. My team of doctors and midwives are up in the Sơn La, the northern uh, high and the northern mountainous areas of Vietnam to serve uh, the uh, women from the ethnic minorities. And uh, just during uh, three days, they already trained 20 local public service providers as well as uh, provided uh, uh, essential family planning services to more than 200 women. So that, that is something that we are doing on a daily basis. Um, and sometimes we say that, okay, yeah, we are, uh, we are not doing things that that um, that are well known by everybody every day. But I really appreciate the efforts made by my my doctors and my midwives, who are kind of traveling away from their families and are serving women right now when we are talking. Um, so. Um, I think uh, for uh, I, I think uh, during the last twenty years in Vietnam, uh, MSI uh, Vietnam really uh, really uh, uh, design uh, and develop and implement our sexual reproductive health uh, right programs really uh, based on the um, the human rights approach. So we. Um, we uh, ensure that the uh, the services, the uh, the goods, and the products that serve women are available and accessible, as well as um, you know they are uh, they are accessible and they are economically accessible, like uh, they are affordable, um, and they and it's of course good at a at a very high level of quality. Um, so I, I think we are doing that, uh, even though we don't, MSI Vietnam does not uh, say, uh, you know, we, we does not make a fuss about, about human rights or sexual reproductive rights, but I believe that what we are doing on a daily basis, day in, day out, we are actually supporting millions and millions of women in Vietnam to materialize their uh, sexual uh, and reproductive rights and uh, to empower them to make uh, choices for them. Um, so that is something that I, I really want to, to share with you um, in, in, in this uh, conversation. You're working over 20 years uh, for MSI. Why you devoted your work um, to this topic? And you said it's so close to your heart, and we want to right. get to know you better. Right. 
Well, I, I think before I before I joined MSI in 1998, uh, I worked in a, in a in a private sector, and uh, really, what attracted me to MSI is that even those it is an it is a charity organization, it is an NGO, but it it never it has never been working in a in a in a real way of a you know of a charity, a charity here I mean that giving everything away. Um, so we the organizations build their business model in in, in a sustainable way. So uh, we uh, we consider ourselves as a as a, a social business, and you know when I the during the first month when I I joined MSI. Uh, and I went out to with, with a team uh, of doctors and, and midwives to Hating. It's, it's a very rural uh, province where I met with um, women who had, you know, five or six, by that time, five or six and even seven uh, kids in the family. And so they, they came to us for... Uh, uh, for long-term family planning. And some of them were not qualified because they, they got mal- uh, they, they, were, they were living in a very poor condition. And that's why uh, they have a, like a malnutrition. And, and that's why we could not serve them. And I saw many of them crying because they could not have access to uh, essential family planning that um, helped them not to have another kids. And that's why um, I thought to myself, um, those things that I thought it was so simple to me and to so many women, there is a, there is a inequality in accessing this kind of essential services. So um, they, ca- they just could not access uh, the services and that's why um, I I thought that um, I as as a leader of MSI in Vietnam, I could and I would be able to work uh, with the partners and with the donor to really bring uh, services and and health education to those poor women, and then I. In the beginning, when I first joined the organization, I thought that I would not stay there for more than six months. I ended up staying 23 years. So it's all about MSI, uh, the, the way that they work. And, you know, every day we, we come to work and we could see that uh, what we are doing uh, every day is actually change the lives of the women. And we can, you know, measure that. It's quantifiable results that we could see. And that's really make 23 years of my career at MSI is never boring. <laughs> and I never had any intention to quit because, uh, you know, those million and million of women in Vietnam who come across, who came across my life, they were part of my life. I'm, I'm one of them. There's no way. I can leave them. So uh, I'm here. <laughs> well, you call yourself a female change maker? Um, I would not, uh, you know, I, I have to say that I am an introvert. I'm really introvert. <laughs> and that's why I, I really feel, uh, <laughs> I really feel embarrassed uh, talking about myself. And I, I never consider what I have been doing during the last 23 years is actually like a, uh, like a change, game changer, if you like, or, or changing the life of women. But our, our services, you know, the, our, our doctors and our people, 150 of my team members in Vietnam, I'm sure they changed the lives of so many women and so many families in, in Vietnam, to which I'm very proud. I'm very proud. I'm, I'm only part of them. I, I, I cannot claim that kind of credibility um, that, that I'm the one who make these changes, but I'm, I'm, 
they are my team. And that's why uh, I'm, I'm very proud to be part of the team that, that have been working together very hard to really bring the changes to the life of, of Vietnamese women on a daily basis. Um, and, and of course, I, I, in, I really enjoy, I, I think the good thing is about working for MSI uh, and, and the good thing about the fact that I worked in business before I joined MSI is actually that kind of business, business argument, um, business knowledge, and MSI is a place that allowed me to, to bring my previous experience and my, pre, uh, my previous knowledge in the business into the, uh, in, into the management and, the, and leading of MSI Vietnam program. And, and today, I have to say that I'm very proud that MSI in Vietnam is 80% independent financially. So we, we only depend, we have only 20% depend, uh, donation from, donor, do, from other donors, external donors. 80% of the income that we make for the, the program are from our own service and, and products distribution. So we are very close to financial sustainability. Um, and that is something that, that you know, I really want to pat my back and also pat the back of my team uh, on that. Yeah, under your leadership, um, MSI Vietnam was awarded the most innovative and sustainable foreign NGO in the country. And so how did you achieve this award? You said and mentioned that uh, you um, you like implemented your management skills, but um, is there another like a special personal or working um, approach? Um. I, I would not say, uh, as I just uh, mentioned it, I, I would never, I would never take credit for for that kind of innovation. Uh, I think uh, I, I'm just one person of my team, and I have a team, a, a senior management team that that is flying with me. I don't have to drag them along, and also MSI uh, from MSI uh, in London or in other other. Uh, the, the thing I really love about them is that they are so open and they actually trust me and they, they have their hands up. They are not micromanaged at all. And that's why, uh, you know, and they were very welcome, the new ideas, and they, they believe that the, those local people uh, would have the best understanding about the market as well as, you know, um, the environment, the local country, the local context. And that's why, you know, most of the time they welcome my ideas and, and the ideas from my team. And they actually invested very heavily in developing the business model that, that, that my team and myself propose uh, for MSI Vietnam. So, you know, it, it's a kind of um, combination of, of all these kind of good enabling factors. It's not only me, it's, it's my team, it's, it's my, my boss from MSI London. Um, yeah, so I, I could claim a little bit, a little bit of that. <laughs> Now, Professor Stoffers, it's your turn. We almost discussed half an hour and the audience, if you have questions, so please write them in the chat so I can uh, pick them and uh, tie them into our discussion. You can ask now or later, so the choice is yours. Professor Stoffers, in uh, the preparation for our discussion, I read about typical uh, characteristics, characteristics of Vietnamese women self-confidence and pragmatic determination. You have been working uh, in Vietnam for many years and you know the country very well. How uh, would you um, describe the role of women in Vietnam? And uh, like also in comparison, let's say to Germany or to other uh, Asian countries in the region, for example, Laos or Cambodia. 
First of all, it's very difficult to say what is typical Vietnamese, what's a typical Vietnamese woman. We now experience <laughs> a very, very modest one, a modest but very active and very committed uh, uh, woman, um, Mrs. Hang. She's really a female change maker. And I met in my past, first of all, I would like to talk about my first impressions, not only about uh, Mrs. Hang, but also about Vietnamese women, because I worked here in Vietnam uh, as banker and now as a head of the foundation. And as banker, it was so interesting when uh, we, uh, I worked for a big German bank, with, I don't want to take the, to, to call the name, but this bank, most of the senior managers are men. So when the man came, all the penguins, uh, let me say that in that way, in the black, black suit and um, dark blue suit, and we come to meet the um, senior managers of our partner bank. We had a 10% stake at that bank. Most of them were women. Okay, they have also been men, but the majority definitely on the senior management level and on the middle management man level and in banking and the low management level are women. So this is the first impression. And I think this is nothing what I can say. Uh, I have the exact figures for that. But having a look at the figures, also, if you look for some statistics, <clears throat> you can see that in Vietnam, there are more women in senior management positions than in Germany, by far more than in Germany. And it's also, I have more experience in Thailand. I cannot say so much about Laos and Cambodia, but in Thailand, it's the same. I think I just, as a preparation for that meeting, nearly 50% of senior management positions in Thailand are uh, done by women. So this is something what we should have in mind. And also some people, when you talk sometimes to managers, and this is really, uh, don't take it as a, as, a, as a quote or something else, but some of uh, my colleagues or manager colleagues, they say they prefer to hire women instead of men. I don't share that. I have excellent Vietnamese male stuff as well as female stuff. But you can see this is sometimes the opinion, the first glance of people who come to Vietnam. But in my opinion, if you have a more deeper insight, you know that there's a very big ambivalence because they are female change ma ma makers and very tough and committed women like Mrs. Hung. But there are also some women who have problems and who are suffering from domestic violence. Uh, it is not related to the city or to the countryside, perhaps more on the countryside where it's more traditional, but also in the city. And this is something which is, uh, I think I did not experience so much in Germany. And definitely in Germany, it's also the case. But here in Vietnam, it is really, uh, I would call it a plague. Today, this morning, uh, I went to one hour, two hour of our project at the Peace House Shelter in Hanoi where our foundation has a project with uh, women from who had experienced physical violence in their homes with uh, mostly with their husbands. And we train them to stand on their own feet. So we give them education, how to do make an own business. We have some specific trainer who uh, also teach them regarding uh, psychology and selling, sales, marketing, and all that stuff. And for me, it was really... Uh, interesting to see that these women, they come from all over Vietnam. They come from the countryside, from ethnic minorities in the mountains, as well as from cities. They are women who have an own business and have been mistreated by their husbands. They are people from lower social strata, as well as people from higher social strata. And this is something which is uh, what most of the people do not see when they come the first time to Vietnam. And Mrs. Hung could say more about that because she is longer in Vietnam than me and she is Vietnamese. But in my opinion, the opportunities for women are quite good here in Vietnam. So when you look go to the universities, many professors, uh, also in senior uh, positions, many female students, I am dealing more with the economics and business admin um, students and professors. Most of them are uh, women in the engineer field. It could be different. But the opportunities, I would uh, say, they are not so bad for women. But uh, the tradition sometimes comes back. And uh, Vietnam uh, was heavily influenced also by Confucianism so that 
uh, you have to respect the higher person, you have to respect the boss and the family, which is most of the time the man. And there's also some kind of suffering that uh, suffering is seen sometimes as a kind of uh, virtue. It's a, something which is good for, for, for women to suffer. And uh, children, school children were taught the story of Kyo. Hang could uh, talk more about that. And this story is a very old one. It is about a, a young woman uh, who, uh, for the sake of her family, who sacrifices herself and goes to prostitution, to, to many different uh, hardships. And that's the ro also one role model, model of Vietnamese women. And what I want to say here is a complete ambivalence. The senior management women who sometimes when they come back home, they have to cook for, for their uh, husband, not for all husbands, there are great Vietnamese men here too, but sometimes traditionally, and on the other hand, uh, they have the background uh, of serving, of suffering. And this suffering is uh, very much uh, in the Vietnamese mindset. By the way, also for the men, Vietnam suffered a, long, a lot during the last uh, wars with China for 1000 years occupation with the United States, with France, and so on. And this suffering is part, in my opinion, of the Vietnamese soul in general and the Vietnamese women in specific. Uh, Hang, before commented, commenting on this bright um, or also the dark side, um, I want to share with you um, a study, it, it was one of the latest government studies on violence uh, against women. Um, almost two thirds of all women in Vietnam have been the victim of physical, sexual or emotional violence once or more times in their life. They suffered restrictions on their freedom and economic threats on the part of their husband. 32 uh, of women had experienced such violence in 2020. So it was also the COVID year. Um, and uh, so um, if you could comment also on this, let's say dark uh, side, Mrs. Hang, how it, how it is influencing your work. And also we received another question uh, about the impact on the SRHR services um, um, yeah, by COVID-19. And because I also mentioned the year 2020. Well, I, uh, I, I, I echo uh, most of what uh, Professor Stoffer just uh, shared about the situation in Vietnam. And uh, being a Vietnamese woman, uh, it, it sounds very familiar. And, and you know, sometimes, I, I think, and sometimes it is just the tip of the iceberg. The problem is, is that, um, the problem is that the women themselves uh, accept it as a as a normal a, as a normality rather than you know as a social norm that rather than something that they need to stand up and fight uh, for themselves. So uh, it's like a beating and um, being abandoned and uh, you know putting all the 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 housework the household burden on on the shoulder of women it's it's uh, it's so popular in vietnam and and uh, uh, andrea just mentioned about you know the a culture the in it is kind of ingrained uh culture traits of, of vietnam so women of good virtue are supposed to sacrifice women of good virtue as supposed not to uh, fight back when their um, when their husband is actually like a, a verbal or even physical physical uh, uh, violence on them, and um, MSI uh, in Vietnam has been integrating uh, the counseling a content of the counseling for service provider. On, uh, on domestic by, uh, uh, gender based and, and domestic violence counseling for women, and also offer the uh, essential uh, reproductive health services for those the uh, for for the victims of the um, of the domestic violence, and um, I I think it, it's it is I have to say that 
it is it would be much easier said than done. The government of Vietnam have all the strategies and policies, and they even have the so-called or mechanism uh, set up in place. And they even UNFPAs and the Association of Farmers even set up a nationwide uh, hotline for the victims of domestic violence to call in. And when I went to Sun La, the local authority explained to me that in each of the village, they have the so-called safety house. They have a safety house to accommodate those women who are the victims of uh, the domestic violence. But, you know, I guess that that is something like a, just a, a scratch of the surface. They need to be, and, and you know, the, the influence by the culture is actually in brain and it's not easy to change. And, you know, unless we start with education for women, for young girls, about their rights and about their, you know, their right to their body and their rights, um, uh, you know, to uh, inhale as well as their rights within the family. Uh, the the share, uh, sharing of the, the house housework and the responsibilities, then I think that is the time when women are aware that they have the right, they would start taking action. Otherwise, you know, I, I could see that there are so many uh, gender-based violent programs in Vietnam are designed without the participation of the of women. So, you know, uh, even when they have all the policy, they're just on paper. The law enforcement in Vietnam is still, you know, it's quite quite at a, a low level and questionable. And many women uh, don't want, they consider it a shame uh, to let other people know that they are the victims of, uh, of the domestic violence. And so, yeah. I, I think it is a, it is an, a, a public issues and a public health issues as well, but it um, it cannot be solved until the women themselves are aware of their right and they are ready to stand to fight for themselves. I that, that's what I believe. <laughs> I want to take in a comment. Um... Women doing housework is all over the world in all societies, even here in Germany. Uh, so, it's yeah. so it is violence against women. I think the role of law matters in particular countries or society. You just mentioned it. So um, what the government is doing exactly to uh, cope with this challenge? Uh, I, I just I just mentioned about um, the government issuing policy and setting up organization mechanism within the within the uh, the grassroots level to protect the women and to facilitate the women to you know uh, to speak out. But you know it is still uh, a long way, and and until I really think that only until the women are aware of their rights and only until the women have a choice to, to be healthy and, and to become um, the owner of their own economy, economic situation. So, you know, if they have money, then they are not, they will not depend on, on their husbands. And that's the first step for them to be like independent and um, to uh, you know, fight for themselves. Otherwise, I think it is very, very difficult. And that, there was another question uh, about the impact of COVID, also on mm. people like SRHR services. And, uh, and another question was also uh, about the biggest challenge in making sure the needs are met, especially in more rural areas. All right. Uh, for the for the impact uh, of COVID uh, among from many many types of impact like uh, 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 incomes loss and uh, and also poor health because they um, cannot 
um, have access to essential health. I, uh, um, you know, the whole health system in Vietnam is actually stretch themselves too thin to cope with COVID. And that's why, you know, we could see that the totally removal of the money that is supposed to go into uh, reproductive health and family planning. So basically there, during COVID, there's no, uh, there's almost no family planning services that are available. At you know at the health facility for for women, uh, especially at the public health sector, and that's why uh, you know I just came back from uh, a trip to Lausanne uh, four weeks ago, and I met with you know uh, three uh, women of reproductive uh, age and from ethnic minority, and they came to a a, a district health center for uh, because they have a problem they. Two of them already have five kids and one of them have six kids. And now they came to the district health center for an abortion. And the uh, abortion service is not, it's just not available. And that's why they have to leave the health facilities, you know, and, and bearing a very, very heavy burden that they have to give birth to another another kid. So, you know, and, and these kind of cases, it's not, not rare, they're quite popular. And especially when all the local health authorities reallocate the resources, the medical staff, and as well as all the money that are supposed to go into family planning, now go to COVID. And so you could say, there's nothing there. And, uh, you know, uh, and, and uh, so that, that is the, the impact of COVID. And UNFPA actually estimated that the unmet needs on family planning during COVID was about 21%. But I just think that it is actually underestimated. Um, so, um, and that, that's the impact uh, of COVID on women. And I'm sure that you know, that, that would become a heavy burden for them, for the women. And that's actually, exactly, that's a, the violation of sexual reproductive rights. Professor Stoffers, uh, you have been in Vietnam during all the corona time. So what were your observations? Perhaps you want to add something, what you observed the impact of COVID uh, for our discussion topic? Yes, I just can say that uh, all governments, including the Vietnamese government, they have to consider both both parts, the health of the population on the one hand, on the other hand, also the health of the economy and the health of the society. So mm -hmm. uh, in general, and what uh, Mrs. Hung is saying that the services are suspended because of the, not because of COVID, because of the COVID measures. This makes uh, people have to think about it uh, are the measures correct or is that what we are doing too much? And this is a decision mm. every government mm. has to take, but it's too difficult to uh, talk too much about COVID and if mm. the measures are correct or not. Sometimes they mm. are going into mm. um, a wrong direction. But what I would like to emphasize is what Mrs. Hung already said, that there are laws, but they are very often still on, only on the paper. So the reality is that the culture comes in, that the culture, the family, for example, says, why are you doing that? Mm. Uh, and so on. Uh, why uh, don't you serve your husband? Why don't you serve the family? Why don't you produce a male hair? Because in Vietnam, it's still important to have a, a male kid and so on. Um, that's the point where the focus has to be set on. Frank, we already talked about the violence, the domestic uh, violence. Uh, what are other challenges for women in Vietnam besides that what we already talked about? Uh, I, I think maybe the biggest challenge now for, for uh, women and especially young, uh, young women in Vietnam, uh, you probably know that Vietnam used to be one of the highest countries 
the top five country with the highest rate of abortion. Um, and uh, uh, nearly 30% of the abortion cases in Vietnam are actually occur among teenager, uh, teenager under 18. And so they are facing with all the challenges of not having the accurate uh, knowledge and, and information about you know, how they can protect themselves from having uh, unwanted pregnancy as well as uh, other sexual transmitted diseases. And I, I think the second challenge is actually the access to uh, safe abortion and, and post-abortion family planning. Uh, the, the, the high rate of abortion can never be, can never be solved without uh, a thorough counseling for uh, young people. Uh, and also, uh, you know, the post-abortion family planning. And it, the health facility and, and doctor have to make sure that those women, and especially young women who come to them for an abortion, have to be counseled. And so they could choose voluntarily a certain family planning method so that they would not come back for repeated abortion. And I think these are the... Um, it's just no, it's not emerging. It has been like that for a long time and it continued to be, and it's just worse by uh, during COVID, I believe. We heard from you that education is one of the keys to face the challenges, especially for young women, but women, women at, um, at all. So perhaps you could uh, give us an example of best practices besides, of course, your work of MSI, but uh, perhaps <laughs> you could introduce us to best practices you are proud of or right. part uh, of that are facing uh, this challenge. Right. Uh, I, I, uh, I think, I mean, education in general, I mean, I guess that everybody understands the benefits of in investing in, in women and, and, and young girls. Um, I think everybody knows about that. Uh, I just think that uh, the choices for women and, and especially uh, giving women uh, an opportunity to uh, educate them is really like a, a, if, if, if they receive the, the proper education in sexual and reproductive health, then they, it's likely that they will stay in the school. They don't have to drop out of the school because they get pregnant. Um, and I also believe that un, unplanned uh, teen pregnancy, teenage pregnancy actually robbed many women, many young women of, of their, their life and their, uh, their opportunity um, and, and their career. Um, and choice, of course, uh, support women to lead uh, if they have the choice and if they, um, they, they can uh, receive their education, they can stand and they can, they can stand firm and, and they fight for themselves and they, they make their own choices whether they would uh, go into marriage or not, or they when they could have men, uh, a, a child, or whether they would have a child at all. So I, I believe that education would, would change women in a, in a positive way. Um, uh, uh, what, what MSI uh, Vietnam has been doing in, uh, during the last, uh, especially, uh, especially 15 years, we, uh, we have the program that targeted at young people um, at the, um, uh, the factories and industrial zone. Uh, there are about 12 million uh, factory workers working in all industrial zones and factories in Vietnam, and there will be more. Um, so they, they in, in some of the industry like garment apparel, there's about eight, uh, 80 to 85% of the, the workers actually female. And in, um, 
we recently worked in um, with a supplier to uh, Apple, uh, and you know, for about thirty five percent of of the female factory workers are unmarried, and they have all of their problems, uh, health problem, uh, sexual reproductive problem, and 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 you know they. The, the company and, and the factories actually feel reluctant to uh, give time for their worker to access information and, and services. And that's why we have to, we used to do all this kind of face-to-face uh, -face health education at the factories and, and supporting service provision, and which we now switch to digital and, and social media uh, education uh, for health, and it's actually the reach, uh, the the rate of uh, reaching out to uh, young women in in the factories and industrial zone increased significantly. So that is something that we we think that you know we um, we already apply the uh, digital technologies to, in order to disseminate the essential information on sexual reproductive health to uh, the, our target group in, in a, you know, in a low cost and, and in, in almost no, no time. So um, that is something that, that we have been doing. And we also train the service provider, the medical staff of the factories um, so that they can provide initial counseling to female factory workers and also refer them because they, you know, they they just don't have any knowledge and and they leave it uh, to to chance. So uh, female factory workers, if they they are young, they are unmarried, and they, if they have they are pregnant, they they don't know where to go. So most of the time, they seek uh, backstreet abortion. And is it unsafe? And you know, or they, they they quit their job. They they lose their job. So. Uh, we, we find every possible way to reach out to, to them and provide them with information and, and supporting services. One uh, female participant um, asked about the death rates of COVID in Vietnam. And as, as in many countries of the global South, is there also high increase of child pregnancy during the COVID lockdown? Mm. Uh, child, child pregnancy. I, I, I believe uh, that. Uh, I mean, COVID's actually impacted uh, everybody, and especially young women uh, when you know they they when doing lockdown. But I also think that in Vietnam, uh, there is a. It is so difficult to get the uh, the official statistics. And that's why you know we could never get this kind of reliable official data. Um, so we have most of the people actually use kind of anecdotal uh, data uh, information. Um, but uh, I, I believe that uh, the Ministry of Health and and some of the government agency considered as a, as a kind of um, uh, saving their face. I mean. They don't want to expose that kind of problem uh, because we already had once had the conversation with the Minister of Health about the uh, the abortion statistics and they they were so defensive when uh, we mentioned to them about the estimates by WHO in two, 2016. WHO estimated Vietnam had had about 1.5 million cases of abortion. And then they were so defensive. And they said, no, 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 the situation cannot be like that. And WHO should just make a fuss about that. And, you know, and that's why we, we could uh, hardly know the, the whole truth. And, and the, uh, those decision makers who sit at the ministry level, they, they just don't, don't have the whole picture. And, and sometimes they just don't know where the problem come from. And so it, it's very difficult for, for the government to make a, a, a proper decision whether to allocate the, 
uh, you know, the people, uh, the uh, human resource as well as, you know, um, financial resources to solve the problem. And, and you, you could see that on national TV, uh, uh, kind of advertising or any contraceptive is, is prohibited. You could never say that on national TV, except for, yeah, I think one or two condoms, but it's very, very rare. You know, for some reason, they consider it as a, like a, a violation of the cultural standard. <laughs> uh, Are you uh, facing any other restrictions like in your work and where you uh, would wish that um, the government uh, could be more supportive? You just mentioned one, uh, one point. Uh, yeah, well, I think um, there, are, uh, there are many... There are many restrictions and, and you know, there are many things that the, the Ministry of Health should do and should not do. <laughs> uh, for example, uh, you know, the, everybody say that, that the private health sector in Vietnam is highly regulated. But from our practical experience, uh, those uh, private Uh, those private clinics that do not uh, comply with the national standard, they can easily get away without consequences. And, and you know, uh, during 12 years working directly to train the, uh, the private uh, OBGYN, um, uh, the uh, uh, private doctor to provide sexual health services, we come across so many harmful practices that, you know, I mean, if we are there, uh, we, and we ask them to change, they probably change, but what if we walk away? So uh, I, I don't think that the, uh, I don't think that the law enforcement as well as the monitoring and control of the compliance to quality standards is actually Is a, uh, is a good practice here in Vietnam. And, you know, it's actually adversely impact on the health of the population because, you know, there are so many unsafe uh, practices like in infection prevention. And that's why, you know, women could walk away with consequences that it's like a silent death. It does not cause a death immediately, but it causes all these kind of infertility, subfertility, and that eventually become a very heavy economic burden for them. You know, the, the rate in Vietnam now, every year, uh, there is about 700,000 to 1 million cases of couple having problem, having difficulty like infertilities and subfertility. And, and it is a huge, huge economic burden, not only to their own family, but there to the society and, and to, you know, to the country as well. And, and it could be avoided, could be avoided. Professor Stoffers, perhaps you want to comment on that last uh, part. Um, and I hope you could also uh, answer some of the questions in the chat or you can, uh, in the F&A or Q&A uh, part. So if you have some ideas or answers, of course, um, uh, Mrs. Hank or Professor Stoffers, you also can, can type in the, the answers, but I try mm. to include uh, all the questions, but Professor Stoffers. Yes. There have been one question about um, uh, the death rate. And the death rate is very difficult to determine. Officially, we have in two years, 28,000 deaths. That means uh, if you uh, say it that, uh, you can see it that 99.9% of the population has survived. That's also like Stanford University says that most mm -hmm. of the people survive and the rates are quite similar. But the problem is, first of all, you cannot believe the figures. And I'm also not convinced that all of the um, uh, leaders here in the country know the exact figures because my wife is Vietnamese and she said, if someone is sick at home, uh, the family doesn't say anything and the family stay at home and they are not reported at cases. On the other hand, uh, it could also be the case that hospitals are reporting uh, 
uh, death cases uh, who are not really death cases. So the figures have to be seen very carefully. But uh, what I would like to emphasize is the effects on the measures are uh, hitting the Vietnamese economy very hard. And mm. also the economic growth rates of 2%, I think the official rates are 2% GDP growth. They are not always true because many Vietnamese work in the informal sector. And Mrs. Han could report from the countryside because I'm most of the time here in Hanoi and some other richer provinces. But she can say with the impact of the people, when people are losing their job in the factories, what does it mean regarding violence at home? and uh, yeah. regarding poverty and so on. And in my sure. opinion, abortion, abortion is, um, I think, uh, the best would be to live in a society where abortion is not necessary. That means yeah. that people have the education, that they are using uh, condoms and uh, con uh, uh, per con contraception against uh, be becoming unwanted pregnant, also education that uh, women and men, they know what uh, what to do on the one hand. And on the other hand, when they get mm. richer, they don't have six kids. All of my mm -hmm. staff, the female staff, they don't have six kids. They have one or two. And they told <laughs> yeah, me of that's, course. They tell me of that's course. enough. So Not too many, yeah. Mm -hmm. Creating a society where abortion is yeah. no longer necessary. And the key uh, is education. Yeah in my opinion, mm. and the second thing, a change of mindset. And number three, mm. certainly the economic development of Vietnam. Mm. Wow, great. I also, I also saw uh, a comment uh, that men should be involved and men should be a, an important part in the sex education. I can't agree more because especially in Vietnam, you know, men, why that most of the men actually uh, assign the responsibility for contraception to women, but you know uh, they are changing, and obviously men have a you know um, a very strong saying in in what kind of contraceptive that the, the their the, their partners or their girlfriends would use, and yeah, so I can't agree more totally. Uh, you know, correct that men should be involved and men should be encouraged in involved in education but should also be encouraged as a role model to take responsibilities in, in using contraception sure which role plays religion in this um in yeah in this terms like in in our discussion <laughs> Uh, you mean the, uh, am I? Moral, am I, the, moral uh, yeah, the religious moral, let's say, or the influence by, uh, let's say, Catholic Church, for example, does it play any role uh, in, in Vietnam? I, 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 I think so. Uh, you know, uh, a couple of years ago when we uh, had, we normally, Mary Stop normally have to arrange our service provision on the market day in, in, the, in a community. And on a market day, those uh, people who, who are the Catholics, they went to the market and then they drop in our you know, mobile facility and they receive a contraceptive and they just walk away, <coughs> pretending that they are not using anything. And so they hide <coughs> there to their husband uh, and and the whole family as well. They they you know, they 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 are so tired of having so many kids, and they were very afraid of you know having an unwanted pregnancy because uh, abortion is even worse, and that's why we had to arrange that. Um, and during the uh, some years, I think during probably the last four four years. There is a there is a movement uh, with uh, some young people being the activists, and they they were like uh, I'm not sure they I would call them anti-choice, but they um, uh, they uh, from they ex expose the fact that they were collecting the tissues of abortion. Um, at the hospital, and so they, and then they bury them, um, and they also, you know, there are some uh, monk 
uh, from uh, kind of uh, the, uh, the, uh, those monks who involved in this kind of a talk and uh, and and in some kind of they they talks about the baby to be killed and they also organized uh, very big like uh, the the big ceremony to in the, in memories of the lost uh, spirit if, if you like and then so it's actually I I think in many ways it caused the concern. For, for, for the women, but it also caused the fear for them because uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's like a criminalizing abortion. And it's actually, I believe that that would, would you know, have an adverse impact on, on the choice for women. Um, but, but that's what they, they are doing. And I, I believe they are still doing it nowadays. Um, yeah. Which impact has religion on Vietnamese uh, society, like from from your observation, from your point? Uh, regarding religion, uh, on the paper, Vietnam is an atheist country. And I give you one example. When I was banker, one of my staff, I know she's Buddhist. She had to give me her identity card for some purposes. And on the identity card, you can see the religion. And on the card mm -hmm. was no religion. Also with my wife, she's also Buddhist, stands no mm. religion. And when I asked uh, my wife and also my old staff, they told me, yes, I'm Buddhist, but the government should not care for that. And in my opinion, that's, the op uh, that's uh, very common in Vietnam, that they don't put the religion too much mm -hmm. uh, in, in front. It is more a kind of tradition, the traditional way of family life, which is mm. uh, beyond uh, the religion, beyond Catholicism or beyond Buddhism. Um, that is what is what is important. And when you go to Catholic households, I'm also Catholic and go to the church here. Uh, in fact, they are Vietnamese, same as the Buddhist Vietnamese. And uh, what uh, the family tradition says is that you have to have uh, kids. The best is to have one daughter at the beginning and the second one should be a boy. Hank could <laughs> say more about that. And if it's more, okay, the more the better, especially in the countryside. So I would not say that religion plays a big role. It is more the tradition here in Vietnam. Mm. And how it does go together with the communist uh, role model? <laughs> I I would not call it communist role model. <laughs> yes. I think, uh, but if I can say something, because in my former life, before I changed to business and economics, I was historians, uh, and I got my PhD <laughs> in Southeast Asian uh, history. And what I can say here that uh, beyond ideology, beyond uh, the colonial rule, beyond communism and so on, there's something which is deep inside um, um, a culture, a nation, which is beyond communism and beyond anything else. And this mm -hmm. has survived mm -hmm. communism. And uh, the communism is a ideology, the uh, system we have here in Vietnam, but the culture is also very important. And in the last years, in my opinion, uh, religion and culture became even more important yeah. than ideology. I totally agree. Yeah. yeah, this would be my question. <laughs> Which terms do you agree? I always agree with, uh, with Professor Stouffer. <laughs> That's a compliment. <laughs> so, so do I with uh, Mrs. Hank. <laughs> So this is a good team. So you, we need some questions from from the audience. And yeah, I just received one. Um, there is a question: Is systemic consolation a solution to prevent entire structures and inheritance of violence as well as ignorance? I think this should be clarified a little bit. Systemic uh, constellation. That means yeah. uh, changing the Combination. system in Vietnam. Mm. As I don't think that the system in Vietnam can be changed so easily. Um, especially if you try to do that, you would get severe problems as an organization if you would like to get rid of the current system. But the uh, issue is you have to 
uh, live in the system and try to make the best out of it, like Marie Stopes is doing it. And uh, mm -hmm. like we are doing it more on the macro, on the economic level with the Friedrich Naumann mm -hmm. Foundation. And, and that's what we are doing. We don't change the system, but we can change mm -hmm. the perception of the individuals. Yeah. And the decision maker as well. Yeah. Yes, sure. In, yeah, in a in a more indirect way. <laughs> Perhaps the participants will clarify it in, in the um, Q and A part, um, but not yet. So we're waiting for that. But in the meantime, mm. let's focus like in the last part uh, of our discussion a bit more about the role, perhaps also the reasons, um, uh, historical reasons. Professor uh, Stockholz mentioned in the very beginning that there are more women than, for example, in Germany on uh, key management position in society. And uh, well, after the reunification in 1975, uh, as I Red women were represented in the economy and the society as much as men. And of course, one reason is the, is the uh, well, in Vietnam uh, called uh, American War, um, in Germany or in the West, the Vietnam War, women were at the forefront, uh, in the front or in the background, they played a significant role. And also, of course, because um, of the coast of the Civil War, uh, Vietnam lacked men at the time, and so women jumped uh, into this gap. And um, um, Professor Stoffers and Mrs. Hang, how uh, has um, has this issue developed during um, the past forty five years? And are there areas where there is uh, perhaps still uh, imbalance? We talked, of course, about other challenges for women, but especially if you look at a society, where are perhaps still imbalances? I would suggest uh, Professor Stoffer to start with, and um, here's her uh, wisdom in this area. <laughs> but I don't have the experience and long time <laughs> in Vietnam uh, like you. <clears throat> but um, okay, what can be said? I think that uh, again, the Vietnamese culture is very much dominated by the traditional roles of the women and the men, and also um, the situation of the women. And one interesting topic, what I can say here is that uh, it's also related to that, that Vietnam is a hierarchical society, but if you compare it with Thailand, which is a pyramid with a king at the top and goes down the entire uh, society, Vietnam is a system of many small pyramids. You have the provinces and the provinces here in Vietnam, they are incredibly independent. Sometimes they are doing something against the interest of the, of the central government and so they are, especially regarding economic decisions, they have a big, uh, um, a big competition between provinces. And also in the villages, the people are incredibly proud of their villages, where they come from. And there's an old saying uh, in Vietnam that the power of the emperor stops at the bamboo wall uh, of the village. That means uh, the emperor can say something and the people have to obey. They have to pay taxes, they have to send soldiers, they have to die, but at the end, uh, the power stops at the bamboo wall. And within the bamboo wall of that pyramid, you find again pyramids of the family and uh, with uh, some, uh, some head of the family, most of the time a man. And this is difficult to break, uh, break up. In my opinion, you mentioned correctly, the war changed a lot. The American war and also the time before the American war, the French who have been here for 80, 90 years and the Chinese for 1000 years in Vietnamese history, there always have been women leading rebellion. And um, don't forget that the Chinese have been for 1000 years here and many streets in Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City are called by heroes against in the war against the Chinese, not only against Americans and French. And many of them have been women also at that time. Hai Ba Chum, Ba Chiao. Uh, and many others, um, uh, just to name, uh, name a few here at this point. And this is something which came up in the American war much more, and it could not be pulled back. So if some man would like to have the status quo until the time before, uh, it is not coming back. And this makes the ambivalence of the Vietnamese society. On the one hand, powerful women, they deserve their standing, they have their standing in the society. And on the other hand, some 
conservative ideas who would like to put them back. And conservative, I don't mean related to any ideology. It can be left or right conservatism. That doesn't count. It's conservativism in itself and not a kind of liberal mindset. And the liberal mindset is that what uh, we are trying to promote. We as a foundation more on the macro level of uh, decision makers, universities, and uh, Mrs. Hang on her level, I would call it a kind of micro level in the ground, talking to the people and so on. Well, I, uh, I, I, first of all, I, I have to say, uh, Professor uh, Sofer, I feel so inadequate <laughs> uh, to, to hear uh, even to, to speak after you. But, but anyway, I, I think that, um, you know, in, it's really, I could see the big difference between uh, population group, those, those women who live in, in urban cities and who are kind of who have a higher level of education, I I really think that they have much more control over their lives and you know the family rather than women in the rural area. Uh, and and but but I I think rural in uh, and women in rural area in, I increasingly understand and they increasingly have their uh, higher economic position and social status within their own communities. Um, you know, as, as you know, nowadays, Vietnam, 70 million out of 100 million people are using internet. And that's why, you know, it's a kind of integrating into the world. So they, and then for, from the people who live in isolated village in, in rural area, now they know everything that is happening in the world. And it's actually like a, a revolution to many people. And once they know uh, what people are doing elsewhere in the world, they, they start asking, oh, why? Why we are doing this? Why it is happening to, to, to us now? Why can we do this? Why can't we do that? And I think that the start of, uh, you know, maybe a peaceful revolution, but it would be a revolution. <laughs> and I'm, I'm sure women would, you know, very soon will <laughs> get the, uh, the uh, better half. <laughs> I mean, I don't mean, <laughs> I don't mean to... Uh, yeah, it is, it is not that I feel like uh, men are being unfair, but, but obviously the, uh, I, I feel in many part of, the, part of the countries and in many part of the population, I feel that women are treated unfairly. It is, it is a society, it is not the individual men who are treating their, their wives or their partner unfairly. I think they are the products of the, the culture. And so, yeah. <laughs> but about this imbalance, so is it, uh, is it attractive for women, for example, to be active in their society and, I don't know, to, to go in politics? Because about the economy and um, we heard about management and other positions, but being active in, in, in politics? Um, Professor Stoffer, you want to uh, share on this? I, I think it's uh, better for your side, but if I can see in the parliament, uh, mm -hmm. men are the majority, but women are not a very, very small and tiny mi uh, minority. They're also quite active yeah. there, but I think it's yeah. better to uh, hand over this question to Hang because she's more <laughs> in uh, that system and knows more about it. Well, I, I think in terms of the policy, obviously there is a there is a whole law about the the structure of the National Assembly members, and whereby they say that women have to uh, account for at least thirty percent, at thirty five percent of the total uh, uh, number of the uh, National Assembly members, and and uh, and I also think that they cascaded that kind of policy down to the even to the provincials and, and the village level as well. 
um, it is still fairly uh, fairly humble now uh, at you know less than thirty percent at the provincial level, uh, twenty nine point something. Uh, but I but I think it is improving, and uh, you know in fairness to in fairness to Vietnam, um, we are still like uh, achieving much more progress than many other countries in the region. Uh, so I just hope that, uh, you know, women would be more and more in, in the leadership team. <laughs> what can be done from the international community to support all the projects that uh, empower women? For example, uh, the mm. Nauman Foundation, but also other, um, yeah, other supporters from all over the world. So what you would wish for the women of Vietnam? Uh, I, 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 uh, I have to say that the women of Vietnam will not ask their partner for independence. They will, they will just gain it and they, they are not backing them and they are not backing the society for, uh, for their, for their uh, kind of in, uh, empowerment. They will empower themselves with their knowledge and with the. And I still believe because I come across during the recent years so many conversations with men, with women in the rural area, and you know the female factory workers. They, you know, uh, an ethnic minority women actually buy a 4D like a Wi-Fi package. 100,000, it's, it's more than me, every month. And I asked her, what did you do with this? And then she said, oh, I'm connected with uh, my friends and I'm connected on Facebook and I talk to a lot of people. I even sell my products like um, strawberries and all these kind of fruits um, on uh, internet, Facebook. So obviously they are learning and they are doing it. And, you know, I, I am totally, it is not just a hope. I believe that women in Vietnam will, will be empowered and they will empower themselves and they will gain, they'll, they'll get the better heart in, in the game. I'm not sure. And that will be soon. That will be very soon. I mean, as long as they have uh, the opportunity to access to information and, you know, education and, you know, they, they don't wait. They, they are not waiting for anybody to do it for them. They are getting it. They are getting it. So I'm, I'm very hopeful. Professor Stoffers, uh, from the work of the Norman Foundation, what kind of recommendations you have like for projects or international projects that could help women? I think what Mrs. Hang said is also is completely correct that the women empower themselves. And what I can observe here is that many women are doing that. And uh, regarding many aspects, for example, the e-commerce as one part, uh, Mrs. Mm -hmm. Hang mentioned uh, the e-commerce in that uh, rural area and mm -hmm. having a look at the use of Bitcoin. If you have a look, which country, which people are in which country are using Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. Number one is Nigeria and number mm -hmm. two is Vietnam with more than 20% already experience in cryptocurrency. Perhaps not the big scale, but they have experience on a small and medium scale. And this is mm -hmm. something Vietnam uh, will uh, build on. And in my opinion, education is, um, is the key. I mentioned it already, but mm -hmm. how can you get education? Education mm -hmm. can you get if an economy is prospering, if it's developing. And that makes me very optimistic because Vietnam uh, got through the crisis, Corona crisis, quite or very, I would say very well compared to the neighboring countries and the others. And now they are preparing to reposition the country on a higher level after the crisis. And they are working very intensively on that. And with this in mind, so that Vietnam is going on that way of economic liberalization. So they have... Uh, uh, lower state quota than Germany. Germany has 50%, Vietnam 25%. That means generation of GDP is not done by the government and by government entities, but by private private industry. 
they have a lot of free trade agreements and that's out to, mm. completely out yeah. of scope to change anything from that. Yeah. They have a liberal yeah. investment law. And Vietnam is currently preparing the next step and the women are an essential part of it. And I'm sure that in the next year, not in two or three years, but starting from the next year, Vietnam will go through and the economy will recover much faster as other economies. And that's the reason that's due to the politics here, which are not always, uh, they also make mistakes, but they are quite prudent compared to mm -hmm. other, other countries uh, regarding fiscal and monetary policy, also regarding support of uh, the businesses and so that they can uh, start over next year. And this will be the chance for Vietnamese women to have an essential stake in that growth and uh, with the growing economy and especially if in the countryside where Mrs. Hung is, if they earn more money, there will not be a question, do I want to have six, seven or eight children? They would look yeah. for a good education for they children. Will. And that's they will. my, yeah, that's they my will. not only my hope, that's my, uh, I'm very convinced of that, that it will happen in Vietnam. I, I, I totally support your, uh, this is what you just say. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Professor uh, Stoffer for your faith in Vietnam. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I just checked if we received new questions from the audience, but this is not the case. I hope that all the questions were answered, either that we discussed them or um, uh, perhaps you received a written answer. So thank you, the audience, uh, for um, so many questions we received during our discussion. So unfortunately, our time is over and now we discussed already <laughs> one and a half hours. This is incredible. It was so interesting. And my last question um, to Mrs. Ang and to Mr. Uh, um, Professor Stoffers, what is your wish uh, for um, the women of Vietnam? So just one sentence for, yeah, for all of us. Yeah. All right. Uh, the, my, my, my wish, uh, for, for the women uh, in Vietnam is that they will have the uh, opportunity to receive education of any types of education, education in health, sexual health, and especially financial, personal finance. How can they you know, make money and you know, uh, protect their money and use the money for their future? I think it is so critical for, for the women in Vietnam. And once they have that, I'm, I'm sure they will be confident and they will master their lives. They will take control of their lives. So education for women. <laughs> and my recommendation would be take care for yourself, take care for your life, be successful. Mm -hmm. And then uh, many other things will follow suit. The country will develop better and you and your family as a woman will also develop better, including your husbands, because I think good husbands should also profit from, from, uh, from female change makers so that we of have a, all male yeah. change makers and the society is developing in a better, in a free and prosperous way. Of course. Thank you so much for this uh, supportive words at the, at the end of our talk, but also the end for this year of our female change maker uh, series. Um, thank you very much, um, Mrs. Hang. Thank you, Professor Stoffers, that you found the time to join us today and to discuss, I think, a, a huge variety. I mean, we started with, uh, with your work, um, Mrs. Hang, your motivation, but then I, I hope that we touched upon uh, important challenges for women and the, the role of women um, in Vietnam. So thank you very much uh, to you, to Hanoi, I would love to visit you very soon. I know the country is not yet open, but if it will be opened, it will be, I hope that it will be one of my first visits uh, in, uh, in Asia again. So thank you so much. Thank you, the audience that you participated and that you stayed so long with us. Uh, it's another online event and we know that you're probably very tired already, but you stayed with us. So we are very thankful. 
uh, and proud. So uh, in the name of the Norman Foundation, um, thank you also for being part of Female Changemaker. You can um, check if you want all our discussions online. So uh, all were live streamed, all were recorded uh, with Veronika Tsepkalo from Belarus, Olga Romanova uh, from Russia, uh, other inspiring women from Mexico, US um, and Poland. US, yeah, I already said, so you can have a look and they will be online and I hope we can continue the series next year. We wish you um, all a Merry Christmas um, and of course all the best uh, for next year 2022 and hope to see you again on one of the other events. So greetings right. to Hanoi and to all of you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I Bye. just want to take I just want to take this opportunity to thank you as such a graceful and charming uh, facilitator. And I would like to thank uh, Professor Stoper and, uh, and I especially, uh, uh, especially thanks to all the audience who actually spent their time and to talk about the women in Vietnam. And I'm sure that, I mean, those who know that that you uh, spend time and, and you interest into, you know, to hear about uh, the women in Vietnam and how their life would be and their future would be, uh, they, they will be really appreciated. So thank you. Thank you very much. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Thank you.